Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. It is day two of GearFest 2015. We are at Sweetwater in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and a special guest has joined us, Sean Pelton. Hey, how Glad you doing? Glad to have you here. Great to see you. Drummer extraordinaire. Oh, man, thank you. I feel very honored to be here. Well, to we're, be a part of it. we're thrilled to have you here. You're going to be doing a, your trios playing, right, later yeah, today? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a group of great musicians. Um, Andy Hess is playing bass, who was in Government Mule for several mm -hmm. years, and um, tours with um, Michael Landau and Robin Ford a lot, um, was part of uh, John Schofield's Uber Jam Band, the groundbreaking band that made that great record, and uh, played with some singer-songwriters too, like Roseanne Cash, Joan Osborne, all sorts of people. So really wide range uh, players, uh, his credits, you know. And then mm -hmm. Teddy Kumpel's playing guitar, and uh, he just got the gig with Joe Jackson in New York. And nice. uh, he's worked with everybody from Tower Power to Feist to um, Nine Inch Nails and different credits. So. Anyway, I'm very fortunate to have them around. And uh, it's an interesting trio because Teddy does this gig in New York every couple of weeks. Um, used to be every Monday, and now it's every couple of weeks at a place called The Rockwood. And um, it's wild. He has this this setup with all sorts of pedals, and, and it's really an organic take on kind of the looping thing, the way you can get layers going. And then he has uh, some framework, some songs, but he has different rhythm sections come in and just jam with him and play, you know, and it's always different every time and goes to different places. And, um, but his way of handling it in the different layers, it, I thought for Gear Fest it would be really cool. You know, there's going to be a close up of all his pedals and how he constructs it and stuff. And then, right. you know, drum wise, I brought some gizmatrons to go with the acoustic drums. And uh, so we're going to, we're going to freak out. That's going to be fun. And have a blast. Yeah. yeah I can't really wait to see that. To it. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be fun. Awesome. Awesome. So you actually have an Indiana connection. That's right. You know, I went to school uh, down in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a jazz major down there. And it was really, it was a really lucky window of time to be there because um, Kenny Aronoff had also gone there. And he's like, you know, a little bit older than I am. And so it was in the early 80s when I was there. And it was right when... Um, Mellencamp was breaking out, mm -hmm. and it was so wild. I got to hang out and study with Kenny and follow him around, you know, help him with his drums, and he was a huge influence, you know. Sure. And, uh, but also at the time, um, there was people going there, like uh, Chris Bode was there, mm -hmm. and um, Jim Beard, a great pianist that went on to work with Wayne Shorter and uh, tons of people. Uh, Bob Hurst played with Winton and then went on to have a great jazz career and was in this night show band for a while when uh, Branford was running it. And um, so it was a really interesting window of time. Um, and I felt so lucky to be there with those players. It really, you know, it's like all right. ships rise with the water level, you know, and it was really, so it was great. Crystal Talaferro was there at that time. We were all in a band together that played a whole circuit, you know, for like Indianapolis and the Vogue and down to Louisville. and. Um, so I felt really lucky that at that time, you know, it was the jazz program, but I was also doing tons of other stuff and working and then like the exposure to Kenny's thing mm -hmm. and the, the rock thing. And so it was a really diverse background and it really helped once I went to New York, you know, um, it really helped me having been exposed to such a wide range of influences and, and continue, you know, I've always worked as a drummer in a band context. So having that during those years too. It was just great, a great experience. It right. was a lot of fun, you know. Right. So were there things you directly took from Kenny, stylistic things or approaches kind of things? Or was it more just the, the rock versus jazz? Well, at the time it was so cool because, um, you know, he got a huge, he got a really big sound out of the drums. And so being exposed to that in, in the context of, uh, you know, touring at, and playing, you know, big, big coliseums or, you know, sheds and out, you know, and getting a, a sound for that kind of context was really interesting being exposed to. And then, you know, seeing him deal with, uh, he was very open about stuff that he was dealing with as working with John in the studio and developing parts and all of that. And being exposed to that at such a young age was so, it was just influential later when I started, you know, getting called, lucky enough to get called to do records and stuff like that, you know. Sure. Having seeing how he was dealing with certain issues and um you know and he's great with people and the way he, he works with people and stuff and um, just huge very thankful to have been exposed to that right, too. right yeah. yeah he's a friend of sweetwater's been out here yeah. several times we always love having him uh, having him visit us he's great yeah. really great so what led you to move to new york what took you there well so it was through uh you know studying with kenny and stuff and then there was an artist uh john eddie 
who was kind of like a Springsteen, Springsteen as art, artist at that time. This was in the late 80s, and he was on Columbia, and he made a record at John's studio, you know, with those guys producing and stuff and playing, and Kenny played on it. So then when that record came out, John needed a drummer to be in the band, and so uh, that's how I moved to the East Coast, you know. Okay. And so that was in like the late 80s. And uh, then it was interesting, you know, being a part of a band that was signed to a major label and then kind of seeing almost everything that can go wrong in that context. Like, you know, the record came out but wasn't promoted that much. And then we got dropped from the label. Then Elektra picked us, picked us up. And uh, David Briggs produced the next record, who was a guy that was associated with Neil Young. And, uh, and uh, so I saw a lot of money go down on that record, you know, and then that record not get released. And then so mm -hmm. it got tricky. And then I started freelancing just to try to, around New York to try to pay the rent and stuff, you sure. know. And uh, was doing a lot of blues gigs, a lot of singer-songwriter gigs around the bitter end and different things like that. And uh, through freelancing, word of mouth, that's how the break came for an audition for, for Saturday Night Live, you know. Okay. And then um, that was such a fortunate break to have. And uh, so from that and then freelancing around town, you know, the session thing started to happen. And, um, I th you know, I was lucky enough to play uh, on some of the Brecker Brothers, they got a Grammy Award in, the, in that time, and then uh, played on the Sean Colvin record that right. got Song of the Year and record. Anyway, so that was all very fortunate and led to you know working more. And um, uh, I really count the blessings for yeah, all of that. Absolutely, well, the, the Saturday Night Live, Live gig has to be tremendous fun. It really and it is, also, yeah. if I understand correctly, the way that it works, it gives you quite a bit of time to work on other other projects yeah. and things. Yeah, it's really. It's so fortunate because uh, the season starts at the end of September and kind of goes to the middle of May. And uh, there's really only 20 to 22 sh live shows a year. Mm -hmm. So all summer's off. And uh, the schedule is kind of like two Saturdays on and then there'll be two weeks off and they uh, show reruns from like the current season, you know. And um, so it kinda, the schedule kind of hodgepodges around throughout the year like that. And so you know, you're able to sort of stay in town, which allows you to sort of set roots into the, the session scene in the freelance community in New York, because you're not always out, in and out on the road and stuff like that. But then right. you also have flexibility, like with the summers off and the weeks that are off, you know, that it doesn't completely tie you down either. So, right. wow. You know. That's awesome. Yeah, and yeah. it's a great band, the musicians, and you know, like James Genius plays bass, you know, who's done so much out with Herbie now a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Lenny Pickett runs the band now from Tower of Power back in the day, and uh, he's just so world class. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so the musicians, you know, like Steve Ture on trombone and di different people, uh, Leon Pendarvis has been there for, on the B3 and uh, just world class musicians. Yeah, right? absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So is that a reading gig? Do you, do you show up and there's a it book of music is. for you? Or? You know, that's so interesting because the SNL thing is a reading gig, and uh, because there's a five piece horn section, it sort of leans that way you know, so that the horns are elder parts and everything like that. But I've subbed on a lot of the other house bands and like for instance, uh, Letterman is actually one of the harder situations because there isn't really an official book, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to do a lot of homework to, to learn a lot of the stuff and you know, like maybe you know, dude look like a lady, but like the bridge is maybe five bars or you know, things like that. And, right. uh, it's, so it's a lot of homework preparing for something like that. And then also that that band has worked together for so long that, you know, they move very quickly and you really got to be on it. You know, like what, like the opening theme is kind of tricky. It has like a seven, eight bar in it or something like that. And I remember showing up this last time that I was, that I was subbing for Anton and then Paul said, so listen, man, we changed the theme and it's one beat shorter, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't, he wasn't really clear about where it was and I started, oh wow, you know, well this is crazy because nobody really told you, you know, and then right. it was sort of in the middle where there's this drum fill thing that happens and then, you know, I asked Will and Will was able to kind of, sort of help me navigate it, but, um, and then the Conan thing, I subbed it on that a couple times and that's a similar thing where there's not really an official book, you know, mm -hmm. so um, it's wild, I, like I hear uh, Questlove that, you know, is amazing the way he does the thing up at the Tonight Show now is, uh, I don't think it's an official book really music wise and it's very, uh, jam orientated and, and in a cool way, like mashup orientated of different fields and things. And, mm -hmm. uh, so it's wild how the how different all those gigs are and you know, but I don't, I wouldn't be able to to hang at the SNL gig if I didn't have the reading thing together, you know. Right. But um, some of the other situations, you know, you can be successful without not having a reading thing together, you know, there's mm -hmm. millions of people that do, but I, I'm glad I have it. How much does that carry over in the studio? How many times do you come in and have a chart? And how many times yeah. is it just? It's so interesting, you know, 
the session thing, it's done so many different ways. Like the thing when the reading comes mostly into play feels like sometimes with the uh, film scores and stuff, and there'll be times where it's very clear and articulate what you have to, to do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of song, songwriter sessions and stuff like that, you know, they may just have a feel and want you to come to the table with an approach, and then it's about, you know, having a system for, if you hear a song a couple times, maybe writing out a, a quick form chart, you know, like I have a way of dealing with all that. So that's not so specific about getting sheet music that you're having to articulate what's on there, you know. But the, right. the film session thing, sometimes it does get into that. You know? mm -hmm. And then it's interesting, sometimes they really want that and then sometimes they want it to be interpreted and it's just sort of a guideline and, you know, having an instinct for that and when you have to like nail it to the wall and when it's just sort of like there and you can make music that falls under your hands the best way from it, you know. So right. It's always interesting yeah. how it goes, yeah. Yeah. Is that the same with, uh, you know, when you're called in to play with a singer-songwriter or an artist, you know, are you often just let do what you do or do they give you a very specific direction? And it can go every different way from that, the most extreme, like uh, I remember working with uh, Shakira once and uh, her thing was very much about transcribing her demos and almost being like a human drum machine and mm -hmm. giving it back to her, you know. And then, and once she got that, then she'd, you should be open to maybe what you had to bring to the table. And then other people have no idea what they want and they're really counting on you to c come up with the goods, you know. And that's what's right. interesting about the session thing, because it's not so much sometimes about chops and playing in 13.8 at 500 beats per minute as like having a concept and different ideas for like a bridge of a tune happens, you know, and they want a, a color change to happen. And like, so, you know, there's players that can come up with five or six really creative ideas for that, you know, and, and then there's other people that might draw a blank after, you know, or have, so it's, an, it's sort of a different muscle musically, you know, that's right. beyond the playing thing. And that's interesting about making records and stuff. It's a whole different sensibility about parts and, you know, feel and working with people and like, can you take, uh, you know, comments and can you have someone tell you exactly what they want and be comfortable giving them that? Mm -hmm. And then can you also come to the table with tons of ideas when they have no idea and they're counting on you to do it, you know? Right. So it's, it's wild. Records are made so many different ways. It's, uh, I try not to think about it in black and white or rules, mm -hmm. you know? You gotta be really open. You've said in interviews where sometimes being a session musician is more about being an arranger and an orchestrator than it is actually being a player with chops. Yeah, I think so, you know, like like the colors of the drum set and then the percussion element, you know, if that's gonna be involved and like, you know, do we wanna go to the ride cymbal or that's not gonna work because of the sound that's happening and it's gonna take up too much space where the guitar thing, you know, like all sorts of things like that, you know, hearing, right. sort of being able to hear the big picture, I think can be important for a mm -hmm. session player, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. you're well known as a pocket groove feel player, in mm -hmm. addition to the different colors that you provide and things. Is that something that you work to develop? Is that a, a, something that a talent that you were born with, or can someone develop that? I, I think that you can be aware of it and try to get to that, and if you make it a priority. Like, it's interesting, once I started working all the time, like, th the context that I was working in was about that, you know, fitting into a musical situation and trying to make things feel great, and, you know, I never, was working so much in a fusion context or in a thing where it was like, you know, I, I was blowing, you know, in odd times and all that. So that's like a really, a blind spot in some ways for, you know, but, but I found that uh, when I was working and making a living and trying to pay rent and stuff like that, what kept coming up was this other skill, you know. And I think there's a real art to doing that, you know, the, that, that side of it too. And I just started focusing on that, like, you know, wow, how did Jim Keltner come up with that sound and that part, and why does this feel so interesting, you know? And, mm -hmm. and then trying to get the programming thing together and have that access to that, you know, and not just be, because I hit a wall once where no matter how much uh, cool organic sounds, you know, one can bring to the table as a traditional drummer, percussionist, you know, like this whole other world and color of the, like the electronics thing started happening, you know? Sure. And then spending the time, you know, trying to get that together, and be fluid with that. Uh, so it kept leading me towards those kind of skill sets as opposed to, oh man, I really need to shed my fast samba thing, you know? Mm -hmm. 
which I mean, I think it's great, you know, and it's really good to have all that together. But I kept getting reinforced for other skills, you know, and getting called to do things that mm -hmm. led down the road of trauma. And I love, you know, I've always loved drummers that can blow the roof off a place with just their feel. Like, what is it about a drummer that just, you know, with the simple beat, like what separates that cat from 20 other people doing it? You know, like what's happening, you know? Right. And I, I've always been attracted to that, you know, people that, drummers that make you want to move your ass, you know? Right, yeah. right, right. So not that the two are at odds, but how do you reconcile that orientation toward groove and, and pocket with playing with a click? In the yeah. studio. Well, it's wild, you know, when I was talking about in the, in the 80s when I was working a lot with this band, and it was kind of like, um, that was the era, there were a lot of sequencers and like the drum machine was starting to happen. And so we played live a lot in a situation where there were some sequencers going on, stuff like that. And that really started doing that, you know, five nights a week on gigs and stuff, helped me become comfortable with it, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it's wild, you know, the whole discussion about click tracks, you know, I can't tell if we'll all look back at the, of this era as like, you know, the dark ages of music making because of <laughs> the, the grid and, and, and um, click tracks. I, I don't know. And when I start to really think about it, I just kind of melt down and don't think about it. <laughs> because I just know as a drummer, I have to survive in this era playing sessions and stuff. You know, and mm -hmm. like a lot of times it is about can you sit with a certain loop that they've got going on and they want that to be featured along with the drums and, you know, are you comfortable doing that and going into a chorus where maybe everybody wants it to, to breathe a little bit and get faster, but you've kind of got to give the illusion that that's happening without actually rushing past the, you know, all these kind of things. Right. And um, it's, there's the art, art to doing that and navigating it, you know, and, I, and uh, I feel lucky that I was in a gig situation where it was sort of, we had to do it because we were playing music that was on the radio at that time that was sort of sequence orientated, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's always interesting skill to get together. You know? Cultivate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so how does a musician cultivate that, whether you're a guitar player, a bass player, a drummer, whatever instrument you're playing? How do you work on that? Well, I think there's ways to set it up in musical contexts that can be really cool. And I think maybe just shedding with it like a, a metronome maybe isn't the most inspiring way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think <clears throat> playing with records and stuff has always been fun and then you know, there's our records from the era that have been made in that way and they're very, you know, grid orientated. So, you know, practicing along with music that's done from that concept, I like the idea, I've always liked the idea of practicing in a musical way, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to just with a metronome or something. But then uh, also shedding with like, you know, there's so much loop material out there that's inspiring and like, you know, instead of a metronome, maybe somebody calls up a stylus feel and it just seems more musical to maybe hang with and you know, and it's, so it's very steady and stuff, but you're feeling like that you're uh, doing it in an organic, more organic music context, you know. Right. Yeah. So I think those, that would make it more, ins a more inspiring process perhaps, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I read an interesting quote in an interview where you were talking about being in the studio and you said, an artist has said, I hate a guy with a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? Well, that's really interesting, you know, because we were talking about this idea of, being able to come to the table with some ideas and then also knowing when to just shut up and listen and do what they want, you know. Mm -hmm. And if they've done a demo and if it's working and they're attached to it because they did it and they like the parts, it, you know, might be cool to get that for them if that's what they're looking for. And then after that, maybe sort of if you have an idea, you can be open with it and stuff. But um, the idea of an artist coming to a, a, a thing, I've seen this happen, they'll come in with a song and they'll be pretty happy with the demo and they just want to get an organic version of it maybe. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, there'll be people sometimes that will chime in with like, oh man, what if we try this? What if we try this? And it can be a great idea. But from the artist standpoint, I think sometimes there's artists that, can I please just get my vision of this? articulated right. first and then then let's go crazy you know but you know just shut that you know just so, no so it's, it's interesting knowing when to bring when to speak up when to shut up right right you know certainly a talent to cultivate if you want to be in the studio whether you're an engineer or an assistant or a musician or... amen yeah i mean i think that ability to deal with people and 
understand what's happening vibe-wise with all the different elements going on, you know, and to be able to put yourself in the artist's shoes or the producer's shoes, you know, all of that. Right. It's really huge, mm -hmm. huge. Right. Yeah. So tell us about the drums you're playing. You know, um, playing a drum workshop, um, Collector Series kit, and it's um, this beautiful Dragonwood kit that John Good has made. And uh, I mean, you know, I'm not like a big salesman kind of guy, but John's commitment to drums and drum making and the way the line sort of evolved with the different wood types and different options, you know, and like, um, like the collector series, you can get it, I think, in cherry and in maple and birch and mahogany. And then there's the gum variations, which make it them a little, maybe less, less resonant, but like punchy. I, you know, it's just amazing. And then the XLT and VLT options, for, you know, for getting more low end and stuff and the way the grains work. And like, he's really passionate about about it, yeah. and you know, it's it's pretty, it's inspiring, you know. And when I when I first got the SNL thing, you know, I was so lucky. It's like, wow, I might, you know, be able to get an endorsement from a company, you know. And so right. I I kept hearing about Drum Workshop at the time, and there was this guy Artie Smith, who's a really famous drum tech in New York for like Steve Jordan and Ferroni and all them. And he was he was saying they were great. And it's like, oh man, I, I really want to try, try these. You know, and I kind of came up playing garage and stuff, and. Uh, so I remember calling John and saying, hey, you know, I got this, I'd love to play the drums, and I wanted to kind of play an American company and everything, and um, he's like, well, okay, you know, we can get your kit there and stuff. I said, well, do you think it might be possible to get a kit to hang out with in town, too, you know, do this? Well, look, man, if you want four kits or something, that's not going to happen, you know, anyway, you know, but it was just interesting, <laughs> and then, uh, but I wanted to do it and play them, and so, you know, we sent a kit for a show, and I loved them, and then, you know, eventually was able to get a kit for in town a couple years later, and, um, I just am so impressed. And the hardware, you know, like the flexibility of the hardware and the different pedals, and I mean, I just, I can't imagine better hardware, you know, right. as far as the, the, the positioning of it and the ease of use and like the bass drum pedals and the whole thing. So, so I'm a fan of John's and his passion about drum making, mm -hmm. you know, I really am. Right, yeah. right. And we're so grateful to them because DW sponsored you coming in and bringing yeah, your trio in yeah. to do the, uh, the performance this afternoon. So. Yeah, and I don't do a whole bunch of clinics and, you know, that's, I, I don't want it to sound like that's why I'm praising John and the company. Like, oh, I understand. I, I know, and I know you know that, but I, I mean, I seriously want to say that uh, at that gig, I could play anything because the companies kind of would want the exposure of the TV sure. thing, you know? Yeah, sure. And um, I really, I've always wanted my actions to speak for where my heart was with that. Like, I... When I go in and do sessions, it's a drum workshop kit, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, I've been at the show since 92, and it's always been drum workshop, and I've, I've just been inspired by the sound of the drums. Right, right, it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. John, thanks so much. Hey, man, appreciate I appreciate your time. It. We're so glad you're here. Looking yeah. forward to the, uh, the performance and workshop later today. It's going to be great. We're going to have fun. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.